Now we're going to enter the marine organic carbon cycle. If CO2 enters the ocean, it can be incorporated by marine plants and animals and then spread throughout the marine food web. We've been doing carbon cycling and food web studies here at the University of Saskatchewan along with people from Louisiana State University in Baton Rouge, University of North Carolina in Wilmington, North Carolina, Woods Hole Oceanographic Institute in Massachusetts, and the Marine Research Institute of Iceland, as well as the University of Iceland's Research Center of the West Fjords. Now, we'll take a look at uh, just one of those projects for right now. This is some work we've been doing in Antarctica on penguins. So just to give you some scale here, these are people, these tiny grains of dark colored rice are people down here. These are chin strap penguins that have climbed up this cliff. They do this several times a day. Fortunately, I only have to do it once a day, maybe once in my lifetime. But several times a day, they climb all the way up here to return to their nest and then all the way back down to feed here in Nest Bay. Now, the tie here is sea ice that forms out here in marine waters adjacent to Antarctica often has a garden of diatoms living underneath. These are microscopic organisms or algae that live under the ice. And it's like an upside down garden. Taking advantage of this upside down garden are animals called krill. They look like little shrimp and actually are little shrimp. So these little shrimp in turn are the main food source for penguins, such as these chin straps. They're also the main food source for animals like this. These are whales or whale bones. Based on what I know about the whaling site here on Deception Island, this whale was probably killed about 80 years ago. Um, this is a competitor of the penguins for krill. And uh, this is just another species of penguin. These are Adelae. Now these Adelae penguins were hit more strongly by this story than these other species, such as chin straps and the, uh, the gen tube. These whales, and this particular whale while it was alive, was a large consumer of krill in this, this area. When the whales were killed off by the Russians, the British, the Norwegians, and ultimately the Americans, the krill populations exploded and so did the penguin populations. Once the whales started coming back, the krill populations crashed and so did the Adelaide penguin population. The chin straps weren't affected quite as much, but there is still a knock-on effect from the uh, demise of the whales and now, fortunately, the recovery of the whales. Again, for scale, here's the National Geographic Explorer in the background. These are people, tourists, that were on this ship. When we talk about carbon reservoir dynamics, we talk about the amount of carbon stored in a number of different reservoirs and the exchange of carbon from one reservoir to another. For our purposes, the most important reservoirs are going to be the rock reservoir, limestone and sedimentary rocks, along with organic matter that is incorporated in these sedimentary rocks, accounts for 50 million gigatons of carbon. The oceanic bicarbonate ion accounts for 37,000 gigatons of carbon. This is the HCO3 minus in seawater. Now on the other extreme, we have atmospheric CO2 here. This is 760 gigatons of carbon in the atmosphere at any given time. And remember, we've increased the concentration quite a bit in the atmosphere over the last 200 years or so. So the amount in the atmosphere is 760 gigatons the amount in rocks and in the ocean is on the order of 50 million. So it's 50 million to 760. Much, much more carbon is stored in these reservoirs than these. And that's important to keep in mind. The atmosphere is a very transient location for carbon. And we've seen something like this in the last lecture. This is the variability in atmospheric CO2 in parts per million as recorded by the Mauna Loa Observatory in Hawaii. These are three individual years. We have 1999, sorry, 1999 here, the year 2000 here, the year 2001 here. And you'll notice that the concentration of CO2 across the board increases towards today. So we'd be 
much higher than this off the chart today, essentially, if we plotted the, the same data set for 2020. So again, we see the rise in CO2 as plants in the northern hemisphere decay, and the decrease in atmospheric CO2 as those plants spring back to greenness in the spring and produce organic carbon throughout the summer, the growing season, and then when the leaves fall off and they go dormant, they give up that CO2 to the atmosphere again. So reservoirs are going to be characterized by the amount of a substance that they're holding at any given time. The size of a reservoir is expressed as mass units or volume units. So we've seen that in terms of gigatons of carbon versus parts per million of CO2 in the atmosphere. We need to remember that reservoirs are temporary repositories for material that flows through them with their size varying in response to imbalances between inflow and outflow. So again, we'll go back to this 60 gigaton carbon deposit in the atmosphere. We have an inflow of 60 gigatons of carbon per year. This comes from respiration and decomposition. And we have an outflow via photosynthesis of 60 gigatons a year. That means this is balanced. The amount of CO2 that goes into the atmosphere is the same as the amount of CO2 that comes out of the atmosphere. If this was true, CO2 would not be increasing in the atmosphere at this time. What we've learned so far in class, this is not true. We have much more CO2 going into the atmosphere than we're taking out. And that's because we're burning up old carbon that was stored as organic matter, in some cases hundreds of millions of years ago. Now this atmosphere as a reservoir of carbon dominantly in the form of CO2, can be thought of as a race car. Here, uh, I guess this is NASCAR. We can think of the race car as a temporary repository or a temporary reservoir of organic carbon. In this case, a mixture of petroleum and I don't know what else goes into these cars, actually. Maybe ethanol, maybe something else. So a temporary reservoir of fuel, we'll just say gasoline, to keep things simple, we dump lots of fuel into this car. It converts that into chemical energy, and the car goes 200 miles an hour. But this is a limited reservoir, so the car runs through this fuel faster than it's replaced. It has to stop in the pit every so often and fill up again. This is an example of steady state. This is a reservoir that has kind of a, I don't know if it's, uh, interesting or scary spillway. Imagine sliding into this thing to your doom. Um, so this thing is set up so that when the lake level rises, it breaches this rim and then flows out. So this is designed to keep the lake at steady state. It's designed to make sure there's no property damage here associated with flooding or drought. Here's an example of a California reservoir that is seeing tough times these days. We've all seen footage of the wildfires in California and only a matter of 10 months ago, the terrible wildfires of Australia that are probably still going on. This is the result of a long-term drought. The reservoir is not in steady state. The water is evaporating. It's not being resupplied. So the lake level is going down. Now, when we look at the effect of Changes in CO2 concentration on the photosynthetic rate of typical plants, we get this kind of relationship. Photosynthetic rates relative to the value for today's atmospheric CO2. The inset reveals the negative feedback loop that results from this dependence. That's over here. So what this is trying to show you is that the photosynthetic rate will increase if the concentration of CO2 in the atmosphere increases. Seems like a good idea. It doesn't seem to work. Now, there are studies that suggest it might work a little bit. Uh, there are studies that suggest it doesn't make a difference. I'm going to lean with it doesn't seem to really make much of a difference. The concentration of CO2 versus the production of organic matter. Now, this brings us to another concept, residence time. Residence time is the average length of time a substance spends in a given reservoir that is at steady state. So if we just click back for a second, this lake, the resonance time is going to be dependent on how often or the degree to which this lake is refilled. 
if the lake is filled continuously, we can see some raindrops here. So it's raining at this time. Uh, this rain is going to fall throughout the watershed here and flow into this lake. The more rain that enters through rivers and runoff, the shorter the residence time. This lake is going to fill up and drain quickly. Now we can decrease the size of this outflow and increase the residence time of the lake. And we could do that manually um, just by changing the outflow dynamics of the lake. If we take a look at the Laurentian Great Lakes as an example, we can see that the lakes are listed up here, Lake Erie here, Lake Huron, Lake Michigan, Lake Ontario, and Lake Superior. Very different sizes and volumes and very different residence times. Lake Erie's residence time is 2.6 years. You can think of Lake Erie essentially as a wide river. Water's flowing in through Lake St. Clair here, the Detroit River, down into the western basin of Lake Erie. This is all less than 30 feet deep. All of the lake here is less than 30 feet deep. Most of it's 10 feet or less, so very, very shallow. The rest of the lake isn't much deeper, so it has this very short residence time. Lake Ontario, about the same surface size as Lake Erie, deeper. Therefore, it has a residence time that's a little more than twice as much as Lake Erie. Lake Superior, the opposite end member, located up here, is the largest in terms of surface area. It's very large in terms of volume compared to the other lakes. And it has the longest residence time, 191 years residence time for a water molecule that enters Lake Superior compared to 2.6 years for a water molecule that enters Lake Erie. This brings us to this means of calculating residence time. Residence time being the average length of time a substance spends in a given reservoir that is at steady state. We calculate the residence time by dividing the reservoir size at steady state by the inflow or outflow rate. So residence time is going to be equal to the reservoir size at steady state divided by the inflow or outflow rate. Fairly simple equation. Now, when we talk about carbon and the carbon cycle, we can refer to carbon as carbon in two different forms, oxidized carbon and reduced carbon. In the simplest way of looking at things, oxidized carbon is carbon combined with oxygen, such as in the skeletons of organisms, carbonate organisms, that is and the carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. So a couple examples here, coral reefs, dominated in terms of structure by corals. You can see a couple of species of corals here. The smaller scale, we have coral and algae, a bunch of them depicted here from my master's thesis work. We have some Neogonia lithon, which is a, a high magnesium calcite, Rhyphocephalus, which is an aragonite, an aconoderm here, or uh, Aristotle's lantern, sometimes called, uh, or a sea urchin, I guess most people would call them. Down here we have Acetabularia, this is aragonitic. A whole bunch of different species of Halamida here, from Manili to Incrisata and Discoidea, don't worry about the names. These are all aragonite producers here. So aragonite, calcite, aragonite. These form very fine grains. When you go to a nice white sand beach, what you're actually walking on here, this white stuff, is death. It's the broken down bits and pieces of organisms like this, with a minor sprinkling of some chewed up corals. And parrot fish eat these things up, produce about two tons of sand per fish. So the fish do a real number on, on these organisms as well as these organisms. So this is oxidized carbon, forms of oxidized carbon in carbonate and in CO2 in the atmosphere. Reduced carbon, on the other hand, is carbon that is combined principally with other carbon atoms, hydrogen and nitrogen. Organic carbon is thus a form of reduced carbon. We see some examples here. This is from Mole Creek National, or what is it called? Mole Creek Karst National Park in Tasmania. You can see an ancient fern forest here, really kind of cool. Here we have Costa Rica with the volcano in the background. All this green is reduced carbon, all the green here, and much of the brown is reduced carbon. And just one more jungle image down here. This is from Belize, 
Again, everything you see in this image that is not a cloud or blue sky is reduced carbon. Now we can break the carbon cycle down into short-term versions and long-term versions or short-term cycles and long-term cycles. In the short term, photosynthesis is a dominant component. Photosynthesis is, in simplest terms, the conversion of inorganic carbon, atmospheric CO2, to organic carbon. So we don't need to know all the details of photosynthesis, the influence of rubisco and the hatch slack pathway, all that stuff. We don't need to know that in Earth system science. It's good if you do, but it's not necessary. What this is important for us from our perspective is in terms of primary productivity. This is the amount of organic matter produced by photosynthesis in a unit time, a minute, a day, a year, and unit area, an acre, square kilometer, square mile, million square miles of the Earth's surface. This productivity is going to be dependent on the population size of primary producers, how many plants and other photosynthesizers and chemosynthesizers are there that are going to provide energy that other organisms can use. This can be summed up in very simple equations as such. Here we have photosynthesis, primary production. We're starting out with CO2 and water. In the presence of some enzymes, we can generate carbohydrates. This is the simplest form of sugar. And as a waste product, we get some oxygen. So by combining CO2 and water, we end up with carbohydrates, something we can eat, and oxygen, something we can breathe. These carbohydrates are used by plants and by the consumers of the plants. The net result is the generation of biomass. Most of the world's biomass is locked up in the form of tree roots and tree trunks. In the presence of oxygen, we can end up with what's known as aerobic respiration, or respiration that uses oxygen. In this case, we have a carbohydrate molecule that we've created up here in photosynthesis. Now we're going to reverse the equation. We're going to add oxygen, and in the presence of enzymes again, we're going to generate CO2 and water. So we're converting sugars with oxygen to CO2 and water. The same thing we started out with up here in photosynthesis, starting out with CO2 and water to get the sugar and oxygen. If there is no oxygen present, which is the case within soil profiles, many soil profiles and sediment sequences in general, say marine um, mud deposits, for instance, there's not going to be significant oxygen present in that mud. So we see domination by methanogenic bacteria. Now they're going to take carbohydrates and in the absence of molecular oxygen, they're going to break this organic matter down and generate CO2. And because we're not using oxygen, another waste product is going to be methane, CH4. This results in very low carbon isotope values in this material. When we look at the marine organic carbon cycle on short time scales, and we're referring to producers and consumers, the green things amongst us and the things that eat the green things, the dominant primary producers in the ocean are going to be the free-floating photosynthetic marine microorganisms that we call phytoplankton. So essentially plant plankton. These organisms are primarily diatoms and other algae such as coccolithophorids. We'll take a look at what these things look like in a second. Well, maybe about 150 seconds. The photic zone is the uppermost portion of the water column where sufficient light is present to carry out photosynthesis. Zooplankton are animal plankton. Zo or zoo meaning animal, plankton. These are free-floating marine consumers, including small invertebrates and microorganisms, such as foraminifera, cannot themselves photosynthesize usually. Now here we have some black and white images, scanning electron micrographs. This is a diatom. They come in many, many sizes and shapes, as you'll see. These are made up of silica, SiO2, kind of an opaline form or a glassy form rather than the form that makes the mineral quartz. So these glassy little tests are the remains of the algae that produce them. Over here, we have a coccolith. These are aragonitic, these little 
poker chips of aragonite form the protective shield around the organic goop that makes them. These are photosynthesizers. This is a foraminifera. This is a consumer, primary consumer. It's made of calcium carbonate, just like the coccolates. These are made of aragonite. These can be a couple of different minerals. And then lastly, we have radiolarians. Their tests are going to be made up of the same type of opaline silica as the diatoms here. Just to give you a little more perspective, here's some of the variety that we can see. Diatoms up here they come in many, as I said, sizes, shapes, and colors. Coccolites, uh, one species presented here, but you can see how they can be broken apart into their components, breaking some of these poker chips off the surface. Down here, we have radiolaria. And over here, we have foraminifera. So again, calcium carbonate, oxidized carbon, calcium carbonate, oxidized carbon, SiO2, no carbon, but the test itself protects the carbon. Radiolarians, SiO2, no carbon, but again, the silica test protects the organic material, the reduced carbon that's inside. <laughs> Thank you.